This is another iRaw podcast. Your journal is going to spark memories of being there at that place. Welcome to Wild Development Studio. Join us as we venture into the breathtaking realm of wildlife arts and untamed adventures. With captivating stories from the field and ideas to dive into the visual arts, we'll ignite your passion for conservation. Get ready to develop something wild. Welcome to Wild Developments, where you can break free from the daily grind and rediscover your wild side with art and adventure. I'm your guide, Lauren, and on today's episode, I am thrilled to welcome Kathy Sedevendemi, Treasurer and Secretary of Northern Rockies Nature Journaling, as well as a dedicated native plant specialist. With a rich background as a Montana native plant grower and past president of the Montana Native Plant Society and former high school art teacher, Kathy brings a wealth of knowledge and passion to the world of nature journaling. As a teacher, consultant, and artist, Kathy's work at Northern Rockies Nature Journaling is all about creating educational opportunities that connect people to the natural world through journaling. This fosters a deep sense of stewardship and community. Join us as she shares her journey and insights on how nature journaling brings people closer together to both the outdoors and each other. Kathy, thank you so much for being here today. Oh, thank you for inviting me. So before we start talking about nature journaling, what was your background before nature journaling? And then Mm. how did you get hooked? (laughs) Well, let's see. Um, growing up, my mom was always an avid outdoors person, and we were always running around outside and watching the birds and whatnot. Um, and I did a lot of hiking in the mountains and that sort of thing. So I was outdoors a lot. In high school, I did art. In college, um, I did some art. I ended up teaching in Alaska, where you end up teaching things that you're not necessarily trained in. So I taught art. Um So I do come to this with an art background um, and I've continued to pursue watercolor and I use that in my journals all the time. And I came to nature journaling through a nature journaling class that was offered in Missoula by a woman named Nancy Seiler, who's quite a wonderful artist. And she did a six weeks class and took us to different parts of Montana or Missoula area and we learned how to nature journal. And as a result of that class, a number of us decided we need to do this all the time. So we formed a group, uh, which we called naturalists with brushes. And we continue to meet every week. Um, Yeah. And it's really grown from there. Um, I would say I've grown, the group has grown. The whole movement, I think, is growing. Yeah, I feel like it's getting a lot more traction and a lot more people are are getting involved with nature journaling. So do you do naturalists with brushes and Northern Rockies nature journaling or those uh, combined programs? Good question, because it's a little confusing. Naturalists with brushes are the local groups that have formed of people that go out and journal once a week. Um, But Northern Rockies Nature Journaling is the umbrella organization, um, which works on doing things like annual conferences, on doing the newsletter, on doing workshops and classes for the public. Um, So it's an overarching group. Uh, So Naturals with Brushes is part of Northern Rockies Nature Journaling. Very nice. So I just did a nature drilling workshop through Wild Wonder Foundation, where I met Valerie, mm-hmm. who's also part of Northern Rockies Nature Journaling. And out of the 95 people that were there, we ended up in the same breakout room and we got to talking. She used to live by me and uh, she was telling <laughs> about uh, okay. Northern Rockies Nature Journaling. And she said that you're a board member and a treasurer. And she said, you've also been crucial in a lot of activities. What are some of the activities and events that you've been involved in? Well, like I said, the annual meetings are a really big thing. Um, we're um, in two weeks, we're going to be at Yellowstone National Park um, for our, our conference. Last year, we were in kind of the northern parts of uh, Montana at the, the Buffalo Range, um, the Kootenai Salish um, Bison Range. And then um, 
Before that, we were in kind of southern Montana, but we have lots of plans for great conferences. So I'm involved in the conferences, in the organization. Um, I'm involved in teaching classes, and sometimes that's just impromptu classes while we're doing the naturalists with brushes. Sometimes it's a specific class. Um, we do things with the Missoula Public Library where we present classes for them. Um, oh, lots of organizations that we work with. When you say uh, you guys have conferences, is that something that you guys run or is that a um, you're doing a speech at a conference that's already happening? No, we actually organized the whole conference. We um, last year we had John Muir Laws come. Um, I don't know if you're familiar with him, but he's kind of the guru almost internationally of nature journaling, um, which was very exciting and fun. Um, and that was at the National Bison Range. And then um, sometimes we have keynote speakers and sometimes we don't. This coming year at Yellowstone, we're not having a keynote speaker, but what we're actually doing is um, Yellowstone Forever is the foundation at the park and we're dividing into buses and going three different directions with naturalists that are really familiar with the, those areas. And so they'll do a presentation on the area and then we'll spend time journaling. So, um, yeah, we, we organize the whole thing. Valerie's, you know, does a huge amount of work. Um, and we have about 35 to 50 people each year. Um, and it's just a wonderful opportunity to get together outdoors and journal. So yeah, we, we actually do all the organization for those. Um, we're a pretty self-contained bunch. So if somebody listening wanted to hop into a conference one year, did they have to be part of your group or can they just show up? How does that work? You just have to register online. Um, unfortunately, registration is closed for this year because we're two weeks out. But um, yeah, it's just an online registration and you don't have to be part of the group. It's just whoever would like to um, to participate. Very good. So, so we actually, it's kind of cool because we get people from all over the country and um, you know they have so many different perspectives and they come from different nat natural areas. And so often they're just so excited about Montana and uh, what what Montana has to offer in terms of nature. So it's, we learn from them and they learn from us and it's a really, really valuable time. Very cool. For somebody that wants to get started in nature journaling, how do you suggest they get started? Go outside. <laughs> <laughs> Um, <laughs> Step one. <laughs> Step one. Um, yeah, and it can be something as simple as having a piece of paper and a pencil. Um, and there's lots of different ways to journal. And one of the cool things about nature journaling is your journal is your journal. And there's no one else in the world that has a journal like yours. You don't have to make it any one way or, or not. Um, but Usually what we do is we settle into a place um, and think about, or just listen, just look, just experience being outdoors and then find something that attracts our attention or something that we're curious about. And uh, sometimes actually we do, you know, sometimes we'll do a landscape, sometimes I'll do a plant, sometimes I'll do a bird. Some, it just depends on what attracts my attention that day. And then um, we write down, we have a thing we call metadata, which is basically, it can be just the date. It can be the time, it can be the temperature, it can be the place, it can be, you know, just all of that information because your journal is going to spark memories of being there at that place. And it's sometimes helpful to know when that was and what was happening anyway. And then, um, for example, I've been doing a lot of botanical focused, botanically focused um, journal entries. Um, and so I'll look at a plant, for example, and I'll maybe measure the height of it and write that down. I'll look at how many petals the flower has. I might look at how their leaves are arranged. And all the 
that stuff I just start sketching down. And you don't have to be an artist. I mean, you can just, it can be stick figure kind of plants. It doesn't have to be, you know, anything that you draw doesn't have to be even recognizable as long as it's something that you can identify with. And then we do things like write questions, you know, as, as I'm sitting and looking at a plant, I can wonder why are the petals yellow? You know, which pollinators are attracted to this plant? Does this plant bloom for a long time or is it really short lived? You know, all these kinds of questions, all this curiosity, which I think then can become fodder for returning home and, you know, looking up some of the answers to that so that we continue to grow. And sometimes people even um, take their sketch that they've made outdoors and improve upon it. Um, you know, people use colored pencils, people use just pen, you know, like a black pen. Some people use watercolor, some people use blotch, some people, I mean, everybody does different stuff. Um, so it's really individual, it's unique to everybody. Um, so to get started, yeah, get a piece of paper, get a pencil, something to lean on and go outside and observe and be curious. Um, yeah. Just get outside, get a piece of paper and a pen or a pencil, and just start jotting down questions and thoughts and ideas, words, numbers. You know, sometimes we count, like, how many flowers are in a bunch? You know, how many do you see? Or how many birds are there in this flock? Or um, what kind of tree is this? And how many of them are around? I mean, it's just being curious, being open, and being quiet. I mean, I think one of the really beautiful parts of nature journaling is just that you're in nature and, you know, sometimes it can be raining, it can be cold or whatever, but you never see that. You you get involved in what you're doing and you just become part of it. Um, you connect with nature and, um, you know, I, I do, I think it's a really... Um, beautiful experience that I wish everybody had an opportunity to do. It's kind of hard to get started on your own, but you can very easily. Um, it's just people aren't really sure whether they're going the right direction or, or not. But I think the thing to say is there's not a direction. It, it's whatever is meaningful to you. I'm glad you earlier you had talked about counting the petals in a flower, the leaves on the flower, like people can look at a flower and be like, okay, what am I supposed to do with this? And how many times does somebody count the number of petals? They, I think we just take for granted, okay, that's a flower, but you're really kind of breaking it down and looking at the details of it, which is something that I think a lot of people have gotten away from. And like mm -hmm. you said too, about the stillness, because everybody's moving so fast and getting outside and with your journal and, and just kind of unplugging and being still is so important. How for somebody that's new to this, how can we, we teach that? Because that's very difficult, especially when I'm teaching children, because they want to run from thing to thing. And usually we're just, we're drawing as we're running through the trail or whatever, and just trying to, to capture what I can out of them. How do you teach people to, to slow down? I think it's intrinsic in the art of journaling. You know, when you go out I mean, some, we're all leading frenetic lives and it, it's really um, crazy. But when you go out and you know that what you're going to do is focus on some piece of nature and you're going to draw it, that very act of drawing will, will focus you, will calm you down, especially if the kids are separated a little bit, if they all go find a different thing to find, to... Um, to journal. I mean, people can be together, but usually we don't talk um, very much when we're journaling because we're so focused on our connection with whatever it is that we're seeing. And I think children get very swept in to the, to the whole focus, um, but they're sometimes distracted by other children around but if they can have an opportunity to kind of spread out a little bit and have their own little space where they can see each other and still feel safe and and all that kind of stuff but where they're doing their own journal 
it's their journal, it's their flower or their tree or their bird or whatever. Um, and then they start to work on it. I think that'll happen. You know, sometimes it'll take a few times for kids to go out and not be um, squirrely. And, and a lot of that is just because they haven't had a, an opportunity to be quiet and to be calm and to see how wonderful that can be. And, and I, I really applaud that you're taking kids out because um, kids need that. We all need our connection with nature. It's a, it's a deep human need and um, kids especially need to have uh, that avenue to, to bring peace to their lives. So. It's important. It was for an after school program. And the first time that I did it, I thought, personally, I thought I'm like, oh my gosh, this was a fail. Cause I had to adapt so much. And then talking to the teacher who was with me, she's like, there were kids that were engaged that aren't normally engaged in the after school program. And they really got involved. So that just like, that was the cherry on top of everything. And like, I, I felt successful after that, but it's so important for them to get outside and get their hands dirty and, and explore yes. like that. Yes. Yes. Well, I applaud you doing that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Is there a particular activity that you find yourself going to time and time again when you're in your journal? We'll be right back. It is hot out, but fall is just around the corner. Why not plan your next New England fall foliage trip with April at yourphototravelguide.com. October 13th through the 19th, 2024, whether you've never used a camera before or you just use your cell phone, you will have plenty of opportunities to capture some of your own postcard worthy photographs on this tour. Let someone else do the driving so you can experience the most out of fall. This is a low impact experience, so it is good for those who prefer not to do long hikes or if you simply want to relax. We embrace all the fall feels, tasting maple syrup, smelling the fresh baked breads, and hearing the crunch of the leaves and seeing the light dance on the trees. And for those who prefer to do it themselves for ultimate flexibility, my friend April also crafts personalized itineraries. See selfdrivenewengland.com, link is in the show notes. Now back to the show. Stay wild. Hmm. That's an interesting question. You know, I think for me, um, because I am a watercolor artist, I go back to, to painting and I, I, I tend toward botanical illustration. You know, I, I um, ran a native plant nursery for 15 years. So that's part of who I am. So for me, getting into uh, the flowers, the phenology is a really important thing to me. What flower is blooming today? What's going to be blooming tomorrow? And kind of having a record just by keeping a journal of when each thing is blooming. And if I noticed any changes, are there more of them or less them? of them? Um, are they more intense in color this year? Are there more pollinators? Um, I mean, all kinds of things. So I, I tend to do a lot of plants because that's who I am. But, you know, like Valerie is very much into kind of science and she's very much more into like ducks and animals. And um, we have a person in our group who's very much into dragonflies and, and dam damselflies. And so the Odin odonology, uh, whatever it is that she's into is just, that's what she focuses on. And different people have different things that they, they focus on. Um, I, I, I think we like to go out and generally sit and we journal, mm, depending on the day between a half hour and an hour every day uh, every, that we go out together and then we generally have a time where we share our journals with each other. So we get ideas from each other so we can see what each other is curious about. Um, and that sharing time, it, it's at first people are very shy about that. They don't want to, especially if they're not very um, 
advanced at, at drawing or whatever. They're, they're very nervous about that, but we're all, it's a very encouraging group and a very encouraging activity. There's no, uh, we don't allow the negative talk at all. Um, so it's just, it helps people feel good about what they're doing and, yeah, it, it it opens our eyes to things that we didn't see, to see what other people saw. The phenology aspect of it, I noticed this year, a lot of things in our area started blooming a lot earlier than normal. Have you noticed any changes throughout the years in your area? Well, you know, it's kind of funny because my, my um, husband was asking me about that the other day, and, and I went back and looked at some of my journals and while it felt like this was a really cold, um, long winter, actually, it's almost to a day exactly the same. Wow. Um, yeah, because so much of what happens with the native plants is tied to daylight hours, not just temperature, but also daylight hours and moisture. So in terms of when they come out, they're pretty much the same. I'm going to have to remember that because it, oh, every winter feels like the longest winter ever. <laughs> it does. Oh, I'm so yeah. happy to be out of it, but. Yep. Yeah. Well, we're just, we're, this is our, the first two days of really warm weather that we're having here. Um, and I have to say, it's just glorious. <laughs> we're just loving it. That's good. Do you have a favorite spot in nature that you like to go to? I have lots of favorite spots. Um, I love the ocean. You know, we we had a sailboat for about eight years. We just sold, but I love being on the ocean and on the islands. And oh, yeah, that's great. Um, but I, you know, my garden. I have a huge native garden, and that's my happy place. It's my special place. But you know, I like to go sit by the edge of a river and watch the the water just rippling and flowing and go to the tops of the mountains and look over the valleys. And I mean, it's just, no, I guess I, I don't really have a favorite. I, they're all my favorite. <laughs> it's, it's just kind of like my plants, but my plants are all my favorites. Um, yeah. I, I think it's just so important for people to be outside, be, you know, put away the, te you know, the television and the phone and, and, and actually we do use our phone to take pictures of what it is that we're, sometimes journaling about, but, um, yeah, just be outside with nature. Mm -hmm. And on the subject of native plants, I try and, and preach that as much as I can. I talk to somebody kind of general public knowledge, and they loved the honeysuckle that are in our area. They think it's so beautiful and why should we cut it down? And I'm trying to explain from your perspective, how can you explain that to somebody about why it is so important to have native species? Well, first of all, I mean, it has to do with the ecosystem that you're in. There's a balance that nature has set up where in a, in a system that has not been disturbed, each plant has its own space and it's worked in, um, within the microbiota and the, and the system of plants and whatnot that are there, they all have their place. But when you disturb that, when one species starts to dominate over another, then that shifts the balance and things start to take over, things start to die. And why is that important? Well, you know, maybe today it isn't important, but pretty soon that, you know, that honeysuckle starts taking over this and this, and then some of the other plants no longer exist. And they, and each plant is tied to the animals, the insects, the birds in that area. And so when you start to lose part of the habitat, you're affecting not only, it's not just the plants, it's all of the, the the ecosystem that are affected, and um, you know, pollinators is a huge thing. I'm sure you're familiar with Doug Tallamy and the work that he's done with pollen pollinators. Are you? I am not. Doug Tallamy, um, he's on the East Coast and he's written um, "Bringing Nature Home." Um, but anyway, he does a lot of research on how pollinators 
interact with native plants and then compares that with how pollinators interact with non-native plants. And the, the difference is huge, is dramatic. And certainly our honeybees, you know, which are not native, um, can come in and interact with all of the different plants. And a lot of in pollinators are uh, specialists that just will have uh, a certain few plants that they visit and others are generalists where they can utilize the honeysuckle or they can use whatever. But again, to keep things in balance, you've got to make sure that you're you're feeding everybody, you know, and you're you're not, yeah, anyway, I'm going off on a tangent. <laughs> but native plants in your area are really important to the whole ecosystem. And so, you know, here in Montana, one of my personal missions has been to make native plants available to people so that they can use those in their landscapes to benefit pollinators, to develop, uh, and to, to benefit actually the, the whole ecosystem. Even if you're just in a city block, um, there are still animals and pollinators that interact with that. So. That's the short, sweet, simple version. If you get me going, I'll talk on that forever. <laughs> I'll have to do a whole nother episode just yeah. on native species. <laughs> so for your uh, watercolor kit, when you're out journaling, it's, well, for me personally, I've gone through a couple different brands trying to find the perfect one for watercolor. What, what kind of brand do you like to use? In terms of the pigments? Uh, as far as like your, the paper that you're using. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I mean, there's so many different components of a kit. Um, I guess when I go out, I take, I, I use, hmm, I use journals and I like the moleskin that are like five by seven. Um, you can open those up and those, the, the thing you want to have for watercolor is you want to have 140 pounds, 300 kilogram, milligram um, paper, watercolor paper in your journal. And you can buy watercolor journals. Um, the other option is to use blocks, which are um, blocks of watercolor paper that are kind of glued around the edges so that it stays flat. Because that's always a problem. If you have cheap paper, it's going to buckle. It's going to... Uh... Good paper is really essential to, to a decent journal entry because when you have poor paper it just doesn't look very good <laughs> sometimes mm -hmm. it all crinkles and it doesn't blend well and blah blah blah, blah. so yeah i use 300 um, pound paper or 440 pound paper always um i i vary on brushes but i would say have a number eight a number eight round that's your one go-to brush um, if you have other choices, I would go to maybe a number four, which is a, a finer round brush, and maybe a liner, which is a real skinny brush that you can make um, stems and, and thin lines with. Um, I would say I carry eight to 10 brushes in the field because I'm doing all kinds of different things and it just depends on what I find you know do I want to do a big wash do I want to do um, a lot of fine detail whatever um, and then I always use um, for a black micron pen whatever pen you use it needs to have archival ink it needs to not bleed when it gets wet um, that's really important otherwise I could show you some big messes that I <laughs> um and happy a pencil <laughs> yeah <laughs> well they didn't come out so happy but um and then pencils um you can use anything from a number two pencil to a mechanical pencil um to your whole drawing pencil it just depends on what you want but just basically a pencil and maybe an eraser although you don't have to have that um i like to have something i can measure with um but you can even have just a little piece of paper that has, uh, you know, this is one, two inches, you know, mm -hmm. just some little thing. And you can hold that up and, and guess, okay, well, that must be 10 inches or whatever. There's lots of little tricks that you can do there. And then, of course, um, carrying water is something that you need for watercolors. And my favorite one for my, my hiking pack is a, a medicine bottle. And I just um, fill it with water. It's just small. It doesn't weigh much. It's, um, you know, ideally you'd have two of them, one for your rinse water and one for your fresh water, but whatever. 
And then I always have either a paper towel or an old rag or something so I can dab up things. Um, yeah, and then you can expand. I mean, you can have so much stuff in your kit. <laughs> <laughs> then you're like lugging things up the mountain. Mm -hmm. um, the other thing that you really need to think about is something to sit on if you're not comfortable sitting on the ground. Um, I know uh, Roseanne Hansen uses a cut up yoga mat that she just, because it's light and easy to carry. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of our girls in the naturalist with brushes actually have folding little folding chairs um, that they bring. I like a chair that sits me really low on the ground so I can spread my paints and my waters and stuff all out around me. Um, everybody has their own thing that they like to do, but think about being comfortable. Think about, you know, the things that you need to have when you're outdoors, you, you, you know, a hat, uh, sunscreen, bug spray, whatever will make you comfortable. So you don't even have to think about any of that stuff. That's a great tip. So, so where can people find you guys at? We are at Northern Rockies Nature Journaling dot org. Okay. And we're also on Facebook, um, both as Northern Rockies Nature Journaling and Naturalists with Brushes. Um, yeah, and I would encourage people, you can sign up for the newsletter. Um, you can see our events that are coming up on our events page. Yeah, but make sure it's Northern Rockies Nature Journaling dot org. And I'll be sure to tag that in the show notes. And before right. we go, what is one tip that you have for someone that would like to connect with nature? Go outside. You know, it can, even if you're just going out your front door and sit down and, you know, whether you live in the city, whether you live in the burbs, wherever you live, there's going to be an ant crawling around. There's going to be a, uh, maybe a flower you can see. You can look at the clouds. You can feel what the what the air is like um there's always some part of nature outdoors and write about it and if you can write about it maybe try drawing something about it and then you're on your way and if you can find like-minded people that would like to do it with you all the better um it's a wonderful activity to to do with other people because you feel not only connected to nature but you end up connected to each other um in a very deep peaceful way and I would say get outside. Great. Thank you so much. And until next time, get outside and see what develops. Thanks for joining Wild Development Studio. We hope this exploration into the world of wildlife arts and adventure has sparked a desire to get outside and connect with something wild. If you have an adventure that's awe-inspiring, don't hesitate to share. Click the link in the description to submit your story to have it featured on our show or be a guest. Until next time, keep connecting to the wild and see what develops. The views, opinions, and statements expressed by individuals during Wild Development Studio productions do not necessarily reflect the views or opinions of Wild Development Studio or its affiliates. Participation in any activities, expeditions, or adventures discussed or promoted during our content may involve inherent risks. It is strongly advised that individuals conduct thorough research, seek professional guidance, and take all necessary precautions before engaging in any such activities. Wild Development Studio, its representatives, or employees shall not be held responsible for any injury, loss, damage, accident, or unforeseen incident that may occur as a result of participating in activities inspired by or discussed in our content. By choosing to engage with our content or act upon any information provided, individuals do so at their own risk and discretion. For more great iRaw podcasts, visit iRawPod.com. That's I-R-O-A-R-P-O-D.com. Ah!